The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Increasing Prep Uptake and Confident Use for HIV Prevention in Diverse Communities. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash BED860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Massive outbreaks of infectious diseases, like pandemics, they reveal a lot about us. They reveal how clever and brilliant we can be. But they also reveal much about us that we don't face or want to face oftentimes, our fears, our anxieties, our denial of the things that are happening around us that we don't like. In the current pandemic, we see this really starkly. With COVID-19, we've seen just how incredibly genius we've been. In a few short months, we've developed technologies that prevent the infection, that treat the infection. We've saved countless lives by being clever, brilliant. At the same time, the pandemic has revealed our anxieties, our fears. It's allowed us to go to dark places where we shouldn't be, but we can't help it. So in many ways, pandemics show us what we are, how we've evolved from small mammals that scurried about, cautious before leaping, skeptical, sniffing out, is it safe, is it not safe, hiding. But at the same time, those very same small little ancestors were able to figure out how to survive when others didn't. And they were clever and resourceful. I've lived through now two pandemics. Certainly now, what we're all experiencing, but also the HIV outbreak, which is a pandemic. Millions of people infected, millions have died. And the same sort of things we see operative now, we've seen during HIV, just stretched out over a much longer period of time. We've come up with amazing technologies to treat HIV, and we've lauded that. We've counted on it. It's been a revolution in healthcare for HIV infection, and it's been able to spread across the world. People pay less attention to some of what we do to prevent HIV, and that has consequences. For instance, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV infection exists. Yet you talk to most people, and it's a surprise to them. You know, years and years after drugs have been approved to prevent HIV, that there's something you can take that's not a vaccine, but prevents you from getting infected, much like a vaccine would. So while we have incredible COVID-19 vaccines, we also have incredible ways of preventing HIV with PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the good news is that it's not just 70 or 80 or 90% effective. It's almost 100% effective when taken as it should be. Also good news is that PrEP has spread across the planet. It got a slow start, but now millions of people are benefiting from PrEP, preventing them from getting HIV. And it's all over the world. It's not just in Europe. It's not just in the United States, not just in Canada. We see it all over, which is fantastic. But we have room to grow. There's a lot of folks, even here, where PrEP was developed, where PrEP has been studied, where PrEP is available, who don't know about it. So here in the United States, the glass isn't even half full, it's more like a quarter full. Of the 1.2 million people who are estimated to be able to benefit from HIV PrEP, maybe about a quarter are on PrEP. It means three quarters of the people who have behaviors who have exposures that could potentially lead them to become infected, uh, aren't benefiting from this. Moreover, like most pandemics, the HIV pandemic, and certainly as COVID has, has revealed how it's not just individually how we react to the stress and the crisis of an infectious disease that's spreading, but it's how in accumulation, 
all the drops of our individual biases, all the drops together that form this pool, this ocean of our society, reveals our shortcomings in taking care of one another. And so what we see is disparities. We see that some of us are accessing PrEP at an extraordinarily higher level than other people. So specifically here in the United States, we can see that if you're white, 66% of those of the 1.2 million who could benefit from PrEP are on PrEP. Two thirds of those within the 1.2 million who are white are on PrEP. Whereas if you're a person of color, if you're African American or black, it's less than 10%. If you're Latino, around 15%. So that 25% doesn't tell you the whole story. In fact, it hides a story and a story that is not very savory, a story that we have to change, that we have to rewrite. My name is Omar Martinez, and I'm an associate professor at Temple's University School of Social Work. Um, I'm on PrEP, um, 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 I've been adhering to PrEP. I, I'm engaged in the HIV prevention continuum, uh, right, as, as a patient too, and very aware of some of the gaps. So where we stand in terms of HIV among Latinos in the United States? We have seen a dramatic increase of new HIV diagnosis among um, this key population, while we see a slight decrease uh, among black, gay, and bisexual men, and a substantial decrease among white, gay, and bisexual men. Um, researchers and scholars have been calling this the invisible HIV epidemic, the invisible Hispanic Latino HIV crisis. And I just wanted to cite the work of Dr. Guillermo Ramos in this area. And, and it's a crisis because we're not hearing about it, right? And, and, and resources are not pouring in into these creed jurisdictions uh, to support HIV prevention and care efforts uh, for these particular populations, right? We, there's a scarce uh, terms of resources uh, to tackle the HIV epidemic among these particular groups. Now, where we start uh, stand in terms of the PrEP continuum of care, and we see critical gaps as well uh, among black and Hispanic um, um, uh, sexual and gender minority populations, right? 80% um, um, of Latinos, right, based on the CDC study, um, have knowledge of their HIV status. 45% have discussed PrEP with a healthcare provider in the past 12 months. 31% have used PrEP in the past 12 months. 59% um, um, have taken um, HIV medication as prescribed by, by the doctor, and only 67% um, are virally suppressed. So we see some critical gaps, not only in the PrEP continuum of care, but also in the HIV care continuum uh, for sexual and gender minority Latinx population. So what are the drivers, right? What are the drivers of the HIV epidemic among Latinx individuals, right? And, and the determinants of PrEP uptake. So in our research and in our work and the work of others, we have documented that is a structures and systems that determine health, right? That impact the health of Latinx populations. In our own work, for example, both qualitatively and quantitatively, we have found that documentation status is a determinant of, of the engagement in the HIV prevention continuum and the care continuum, including PrEP, access to PrEP, right? Um, not having your documentation status, right? Um, that clinical staff, that interaction with the provider, right? Uh, not having insurance, the questions that are followed after that, right? Uh, that interaction of that undocumented individual with the clinical setting, with the provider, with the frontline staff, right? Within that clinical setting, uh, that becomes a barrier for engagement in prevention and care. So what I suggest, right, is, is create visuals, right, within your organization and service and support systems in Spanish that are culturally and linguistically appropriate, that create that clinic settings um, environment of openness, right, and, and welcoming uh, to all type of, of, of populations, including undocumented immigrants, right? So creating visuals, um, creating a welcoming uh, environment within the clinic settings. So it could be posters, it could be education um, in Spanish that is once again culturally and linguistically appropriate that uh, demonstrate that, that this clinic serves 
right, all type of Latinx individuals, right, including uh, undocumented immigrants, right? And I think that another way to um, channel that information of inclusiveness is through social media, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, right? Organizations need to be creative in how to um, disseminate services and, 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 and provide services beyond uh, that face-to-face -face interaction, right? Channel uh, this information and visuals through social media networks, right? One of the things that Copy has taught us is that, you know, technologies can be really helpful, right? Uh, and thinking innovative about uh, mHealth technologies, right? EMA inform EMI on how to reach and engage um, populations beyond um, that clinical settings, right? And, and how to go where patients are at, right? And engage them through telehealth, um, promoting telehealth, um, strategies and, 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 and using these social media networks to channel information to address some of these critical barriers, right, um, including documentation status. You can dive down even a little deeper and see that there's differences not only by complexion, by background, by ethnicity, but also who you are in other ways. I'm Nigerian, um, so my uh, growing up my parents um, weren't really open to, to talking about sex and the idea of you know me being gay um, was also you know another sort of like onion layer to um, all of that and um, we always the, the, the one thing that always uh, that I always feared was catching an STD or um, catching HIV because you know then the, the repercussions of that's you know getting on medication telling my parents um, and, you know, having them find out about me, finding out about, uh, you know, this sort of other life that I have. Um, so I, I wouldn't really, so I would, um, you know, I would have my sexual, uh, when I was, I want to say 15, 16, um, I would have, you know, my encounters, um, and then some days like panic because, um, that fear and knowing that, you know, I'm not getting tested regularly or I'm not, you know, I'm not, um, getting myself checked up um, was a bit of a was was you know a, a, a really uh, scary at the time when I would go get tested um, I think you know I would like put down a fake name because I just didn't want it to go back onto my parents insurance that you know hey he was at this clinic um, and then I think uh, 17 was when I went to uh, DC Health and Wellness and met uh, with um, one with a provider who talked me through who talked me through um, prep and the um, you know getting tested every three months, um, the protection from prep and um, being protected uh, from uh, HIV, and I got um, he pro he provided me with um, a prescription with a prescription, and. Um, <laughs> I remember that being my, I remember that prescription being my like 30 days. And then after that, I didn't go back because I, I, I don't know. I, I still had this fear. I still have that, you know, internal fear and stigma of, you know, parents finding out. I um, stopped taking prep because I, one, forgot my provider's name. I will say that I forgot my provider's name. I didn't know who, to, uh, I didn't know how to, um, who to ask for when I was calling um, DC Health and Wellness. And I would get different providers um, that would, you know, do do these screenings. And um, I think the two the the two uh, run-ins um, made me not want to to you know continue on prep because I felt like the just the way that the provider was um, just conducting the whole appointment um, felt a little off. Um, and then I met the provider that I have now, um, who's at DC Health and Wellness, who again um I, I think we bumped into each other in the hallway um and he was like do you still have do, are you still on prep and i was like no so after my appointment he like pulled me aside got me another prescription and then put me on his schedule and ever since then you know it's it's been on repeat um so it's it's been a it's 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 been something you know it's been this layer of, uh, or this like safe um how do i say it um, safe of mind or, you know, just be, being able to be on prep and, you know, have these encounters, knowing, um, knowing where I was before when, you know, I was always scared to, you know, be myself and, you know, have these sexual experiences because I was, um, you know, in fear of, 
you know, living up to this, this, this sort of like parental disappointment that, you know, they, that, you know, they would always, where they would always be like, you know, the, the one thing that's going to happen, you know, it, it's, it's punishment if you catch HIV or, you know, it's, it's punishment for being gay. And I think that really stuck with me. So, um, you know, finding this provider, being able to um, have, you know, have this pill that can protect me as I'm going, um, again, gives me this um, sort of ease and safe of mind um, as I'm going out, as I'm having these experiences. And knowing that, you know, I'm also getting tested every three months um, adds this another layer of responsibility um, to my sexual experiences and encounters. According to the CDC, if you break it down just simply by male and female, that's how they've done it, males are more likely to get PrEP. These are people at risk compared to females. When we look at age, people who are in their middle ages, not the younger, not the older, even if they're at risk, are not benefiting, accessing, utilizing PrEP. Complicated reasons. So less than 10% of women who can acquire HIV are not on PrEP. We also see that when we look at men who have sex with men, there's differences too. And remember, persons of color who are same gender loving men make up about half of new HIV infections. Yet they do not make up the majority of PrEP use in our country. So again, huge disparities between if you're white, you're Latino, you're black, African American, and your access and use of PrEP. Even when you're a man who's at risk for acquiring HIV, the highest risk that we have in our country. There's also geography, and this all plays together. These are not disparate, separate entities. These, these are not just little boxes. These are more like Russian dolls where it's nested within each other. In the South, where half of people living with HIV live, and where more than half of new infections are diagnosed, it's only about 30% of all PrEP users in the United States are located in our part of the country. So there's a disparity. There's a, there's a gap between the need for PrEP and the use of PrEP. And again, it's most stark here in our part of the country where we suffer from many other exaggerated disparities and injustices. And so this is all part of one big picture. And again, pandemics reveal this, sometimes when we don't want to see it. Over the last several years, we've seen remarkable benefits. So all the things we've talked about, the therapeutics, the prevention, the education, these things have had an impact. Finally, it took a long time. For many years, I would say 50,000 new cases a year, 50,000 new diagnoses a year of HIV. It was a mantra, but it started to change. Just a few years ago, we started to see the numbers go down, and that's a consequence of treatment as prevention. More people were getting access to treatment. Treatment was better tolerated, more potent. And we started to see that people were less likely to transmit their virus to others. Undetectable equals untransmissible. U equals U. But at the same time, we also saw PrEP start to finally take off. But again, there's been imbalances and who's benefiting most from these changes. So while overall, the number of new cases has dramatically dropped, maybe by as much as 20% before the COVID-19 pandemic, we can see those drops have been uneven. The greatest drops among gay and bisexual men who are white. Whereas for African-American and black men who have sex with men, modest change at all. Okay. And maybe even some increase among Latino and Hispanic men. So when we look at the numbers and we congratulate ourselves about a 20% decline, we shouldn't. We should realize that they're revealing something very, very stark, and that there is an injustice in the use of PrEP in the United States. So if we really want to get to our goals, our targets, we just can't take the easiest path, getting people who have insurance on PrEP, getting people who are motivated, who are educated, or whatever you know, term you want to use to describe those who are more privileged, and them getting prep, but not other people, uh, that's not how we're going to achieve our goal. That's how we make an inflection, but that's not how we keep going on the slope that we need to go 
that we need to ride to get to where we want to go. We have HIV where we want it. We have incredible therapies that not only treat the individual and keep them from getting sick, but keep them from passing on their virus. And we have incredible modalities to prevent people from acquiring the virus who are at risk. We now have pills and now an injection that people can take every two months to prevent themselves. So we're not right now at a point where we need. We don't have all the choices we need. It's not like contraception, where there's an array of different pills, devices, shots that people can take. We'll get there, and we're starting to, but we need to do better. And it starts with us, with clinicians. Clinicians really are the gatekeeper here. And while we'll talk about maybe motivating people, educating people, making them aware that PrEP exists, we have to realize that we play a very important role as a portal to getting people to recognize their risk, to understand how they could benefit from something that, again, we should be proud of, that's genius. And again, we're doing this with COVID-19 all the time. The parallels just you know, are inescapable. We can see for ourselves that we're trying to convince people all the time to make good decisions about their health, protect themselves and their communities with COVID-19. We could do the same thing with HIV, using some of the same terms, using what we know. So allowing people to understand that they may be at more risk than they appreciate by talking to them about their sexual health, about their thoughts about their well-being, about what's important to them. So clinicians play a really important role. And it's not just about can you take a pill every day. We have more and more ways of getting people to be protected from getting infected with HIV, including taking a pill a day, uh, well-tolerated, effective, or maybe taking pills just around their exposure. Okay? So for men who have sex with men, we know pretty clearly that TDF, FTC, two pills taken within two to 24 hours before sex, then 24 hours after one event, take one other pill, 48 hours after the event, take another pill, works just as well as taking a pill a day. We know that we now have these injections, really brand new. It's another option for people. Clinicians can make people aware of it. They don't know this. You do. And now you're obligated to share that information. I saw my first patient yesterday in clinic who is recently diagnosed with HIV. She's a trans woman. She was in a committed relationship. She didn't think she was going to be at risk, but then found out that her partner was HIV infected. And when she got a viral illness and thought it was COVID-19, but tested negative for COVID-19 at the end of December, got an HIV test and it was positive. And I asked her yesterday, I said, did you know about PrEP? And she said, I knew about it, but I didn't think that I needed it. And no one really ever talked to me about it. My doctors really never mentioned it. Maybe in passing, maybe I saw a pamphlet. Maybe I saw something on TV. But no one really had a serious conversation with me about this. This despite her being in a demographic that's known to have extraordinary risk for acquiring HIV infection. Hello, I'm Taylor Leanne Chandler Walker. Um, I live in Washington, DC. I am part of the LGBTQIA2S plus community. I was born intersex. I also identify as transgender but I see transgender as a verb, and now I'm just a female. Um, PrEP in our community is twofold. Um, people that look like me tend to have a primary care physician, so it makes access to PrEP easier. But I think where we fall short is people don't understand the necessity of PrEP. If you are having sex, I don't care if you're part of my community, or you are cis, het, and straight, you should be on PrEP. It's like birth control. Um, it's there to protect you. And, you know, we are all about sex positivity, but at the same time, you need to be sensible about your vulnerabilities when engaging in sexual activity. So for me, I went to my doctor and I asked about PrEP. I'm married, but I felt, you know, 
married people have affairs? Do I need to be on prep? Do I disclose to my husband that I'm on prep or do I not? Do I tell my husband to be on prep? There was a lot of um, distinguishing factors that played into why I would or wouldn't be on prep. So I chose not to be um, because I feel confident in my marriage. Um, let's hope a year from now in a time capsule, I'm not playing a fool. <laughs> but the reality is, you know, you have the ability to protect yourself. You have the right to control what happens to your body and it is your responsibility you can't depend on your partner to protect you because they won't always do that especially in heat of passion moments or if alcohol is involved so when we look at statistically black trans women and prep you know it's almost like a rite of passage unfortunately even now in 2022 that black trans women are still involved in survival sex work. So that puts them at an extremely high risk of contracting sexually transmitted diseases, as well as contracting and living with HIV. That's who needs to be on PrEP. But unfortunately, that's who it's the hardest to get on PrEP. Why, you say? Well, a myriad of reasons. Mental health, homelessness, at risk for homelessness, equity and housing. Um, so all these factors come into play. If you're hungry and you're depressed and you're selling your body to survive, are you really going to think, oh, I need to take prep today? Um, and that's what needs to change. There needs to be an easier way to get prep to the people that need it the most. So instead of going here, you sign up, you take your HIV test to make sure you're even eligible to be on PrEP. Then you get referred over here. Then they're going to either give you seven pills, the trial to start once you're approved, or they're going to mail it to you, or they're going to mail it to the clinic and you have to come get it. So all of a sudden we still have all these um, parameters that still have to be jumped through. And when people are homeless or at risk or engaging in survival sex work, priorities change all day long, every day. And so at that point, it's like, what can we do to make it easier for people that need to be on prep to be on prep? Personally, I feel the reason that black trans women aren't getting the access to prep they need is because whether you want to say government or health officials, that's not their priority. I, I want to, in a way, say they don't care, but that seems cold, but that in a lot of ways seems like the reality that we live in in 2022. Um, racism has a lot of different ways of impacting community, and when you don't care about a certain race of people being sick or transmitting a, an illness or a disease, why treat them? When we say we're going to meet people where they are, it really means that. So if they come in and you're pushing prep and they're starving and homeless, maybe that day you provide food resources, you provide a shelter because you know what? They're going to come back and you're going to get that opportunity the second time to promote prep. That's what meeting people where they are is all about. If I was single, I would be on PrEP. When you think back to the early 80s when HIV and AIDS hit this country, people would have killed to have something like PrEP. And here we are in 2022 and we can't give it away. You know, the people that need it the most are not on it. So we ask ourselves, why is that? I think there's a myriad of answers. Um, for black people, there's trust in the medical profession. And there's plenty of people that can speak to that on both sides of the spectrum. For people that are homeless or at risk, their priorities are different. For people that are married, they're trusting their marriage. They're trusting their partner. For people that are dating, again, trust. But I know for a fact here in 
DC, the toxic masculinity that is present in black community prevents someone that is black that is interested in women of a trans experience. So if he sleeps with one, he's gonna sleep with all of them. Well, statistically we know more than likely one of them is gonna be living with HIV. Depending on their mental health status, their living arrangement, maybe they take their medication and their U equals U so that they're um, undetectable, but maybe they aren't. So this is where we have to educate people, in my opinion, that PrEP is like birth control. If you're having sex, you take PrEP, plain and simple. It's that simple. And we make it easier. We make less hoops to jump through to get it to the people that need it most. If you live in any part of our country that is seeing incident HIV, I feel you're obligated to know more about PrEP, to understand how your patients can access it, to talk to them, to offer it to people, to have the conversation so you can understand, is this something that would fit for them? Just like we think about, can I reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease? Can I reduce your risk of colon cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer? We assess risk and then we act appropriately and accordingly. We could do the same thing. So there's places across the country, I'm not showing you where HIV is prevalent, I'm showing you where HIV is incident. If you live in any one of these shaded counties, you should know about PrEP. And maybe that's the most important thing, that we really target the areas where we're seeing new diagnoses, because there's a reason there's, there's HIV occurring in these places. The other thing we have to do, because we're not standing up as strongly and leaning in as much as we should, is we have to reach out to people who could benefit directly, direct to consumer, if you will. And this has been done marvelously in New York City, where the municipality has taken a very strong stand on advocating that PrEP be available to New Yorkers. And so if you're in New York, it's not uncommon to see billboards, to see subway signs, to see commercials, uh, to see flyers all over the place talking about PrEP and avoiding HIV. And it's multicultural, it's accessible, um, it's relatable. And we could do that too nationwide. That the CDC is, I think, really stepping up after a slow start and this you know, ready, set, prep campaign that they've launched is for people in the community, but also for us. We could learn a lot from this. And I think it's a really good head start in normalizing this and making it attractive. We, we have incredible marketing minds that can market all sorts of things to get people to buy them. And so we have to have people buy in to prep, to understand their risk, to understand, yeah, you might have to take a pill a day or you might have to take a shot every two months, but it's worth it and it's normal. Just like people sometimes do things like that to prevent themselves from getting pregnant or prevent themselves from having a heart attack. Um, so these are the kinds of things we have to think about together. So hopefully, at the end of this, you understand PrEP is amazing. What an incredible tool. Until we get a vaccine, this is what we got. And it's as more effective than most any vaccine we've ever seen. It's safe. It works. We have it for everyone, regardless of the potential ways that they can become infected with HIV. For most people, it's affordable or free. Uh, but it takes you know, being aware. You're being aware, you're being familiar, you're being able and comfortable to offer it to your patients, and then people being willing and accepting of this to understand their risk. You and our patients together can come to a point where you can understand the benefits of PrEP and the benefits of PrEP and help level that playing field so that we can get to where we wanna get. We have HIV on the downslope, let's get it to zero. That's our goal, but we can't get it to zero unless all of us get it to zero together. And I think that's obvious. So for communities that are impacted heavily by HIV, same communities impacted heavily by COVID-19 oftentimes, let's work together to protect them. And by doing that, we protect all of us. So with that, ready, set, prep. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com.
forward slash BED860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Gilead Sciences, Incorporated.